and Sarah's face was pressed up against a cold, hard surface. Slowly, she opened her eyes. She was sprawled out uncomfortably across the stone floor. There had been a dream, a nightmare. But where was she now? Lifting her head, she recognised the altar and steps of St Andrew's lit by the first dim rays of dawn barely making their passage through the great window. She scrambled groggily to her feet and dived between the pews quickly, expecting blows to rain down upon her. But nothing happened. There was no noise, no movement. Nervously, she looked up over the pew and around the church. The pale light shone through the high, round stained glass dimly lighting the empty nave. Sarah was alone. As the realisation filled her, she looked around. There was no trace of the fight or the bloodshed. The cross had fallen from the altar and lay not far from her on the stone floor. Apart from that, nothing at all to indicate what had passed. She looked up. Hanging from the roof was an electric light. Slowly, in a flood of relief, she realised it had all been a dream. No, not a dream. A terrible, terrible nightmare that had been so vivid, so terrifying. She stood on feeble legs, holding onto the pew for support. Her dress was torn and wet, her hands were scratched and sore. Her feet and shoes were covered in mud. What had happened last night? Surely Alex had not been that stupid as to put something into the fruit punch. She looked down at herself again. Her mom would throw a bit. Sarah walked to and pushed open the church doors and stepped out into the early morning. It had been cold the last night and now, as the comparative warmth of the day approached, a fog lay thick over the landscape. Whatever her mother said, she would be happy to take the argument. She was so very relieved that her nightmare was over. Halfway along Barrow Lane, an old blue van materialised out of the mist, coming from the direction of the manor. It screeched to a halt alongside her, skidded noisily on the loose gravel. A boy hung his head out the window. It was Alex. Sarah leaned down. Sandra and Barbara were sat alongside him, Steve and Jason in behind. Where did you get to last night? Alex asked. I don't know. I mean, I can't remember. She replied, feeling a little foolish. Been smoking those funny cigarettes again, have you? All the occupants of the man laughed. I didn't have anything, she smiled up weakly. I just can't remember. She was even more embarrassed now. They were smiling in a friendly way. Come on, get in. You need a cup of strong black coffee. I was going home. Come on. We're off to the transport cap for breakfast. It'll do you good. Come on, get in. You're going the wrong direction for the highway. I know that. I'm not stupid. We came looking for you. We were worried after you walked out. Walked out? You said you felt dizzy. I wanted some fresh air. Alex could see she was puzzled. You really don't remember, do you? All right, she said, one cup, but afterwards I'm going straight home. I feel a mess. Yeah, he looked up and down. You'd better get in the back. I don't want to dirty my seats. They all broke into laughter. Sarah went round and lifted the top half of the tailgate, stood on the tow wall bracket, and climbed in. She went to shut the flap, but Steve stopped her. Leave the top half open. open so we can get some fresh morning air. It'll wake us all up. But Alex always said it draws an exhaust view. I never said that. No, leave it open. Alex turned the van around in the lower lane and accelerated away towards the Pan Hills, pausing close to Murray Manor. Stara stared out at the building. It was still there. It hadn't burned down. It was just as it had always been. No one spoke. They were stared for looking or waiting. Eventually Alex broke the silence. The chicane's coming up. The police had long tried to stop teenage boys of the district from testing their driving skill along the widening section 
known as the chicane. Many of the youths returned with damaged body panels in evidence of their attempt. It was a dangerous place with steep drops into the Penn River and as the band leaped over on the first of the numerous bends, Steve and Jason looked at Sarah. It's time, said Jason. Time for what? Sarah had no idea what they were talking about. Steve leaned towards her. He took hold of her wrists and Jason her ankles. Sarah offered no immediate resistance. She was surprised but not concerned. Pag it in you guys, I'm not in the mood, I'm tired. But they didn't have the mischievous grins they should have had. They both looked deadly serious, and instead of letting her go, they pushed her back towards the tailgate. This is not funny, let me go, she demanded. But Jason was transferring his grip to her knees, and was lifting them over the tailgate. The vehicle swung into another curve, crunching gravel as the tyres slid sideways across the widths of the road. Sarah fell back into the van. That's it, that's enough, she snapped angrily. Let go of me. Both of them were crushing her against the back panel as she began to kick and struggle. Are you listening? She was very angry now. This is not funny, let me go. She looked over her shoulder at the dust that sprayed up behind her. She was still not frightened, but it was long past the joke. Steve held her wrists tightly as Jason slipped his hands under her legs again, bodily lifting her lower half up and over the gate. Sarah dragged one leg back against him. Pushing, she closed her knees, one on either side of the cold metal panel. No, she pleaded. Now she was getting frightened. Jason leaned back and brutally kicked her thighs several times until she was forced to let go. Sarah was now half out of the van, her feet dangling in the air, balancing on her stomach. The van swerved from side to side. She felt like she was being cut in two as the lock mechanism scraped backwards and forward across her flesh. Sharp rocks showered, showered back and up from the rear wheel, stinging and cutting her feet and ankles. No, stop it, please! She sobbed as Jason took one of her wrists from Steve. Slowly, they spurred her out, bit by bit, from the vehicle. She was trying to scream, but she had no breath. She balanced on her ribcage, her stomach crushed. They suddenly let her move. Sarah found her voice. Her scream roared back at her from inside the van. No, no, she wept, looking into their blank and caring faces. She was bouncing up and down on the narrow tailgate lock, the sharp latch causing excruciating pain. She was sure her chest would cave in soon. Suddenly her feet felt the rough road beneath them. One shoe was torn off. The van's speed was increasing. Sarah lifted her feet, swinging her ankle, banging painfully, painfully into the tow wall bracket and quickly she grasped it, foot above and the other below. Kinging off her other shoe, her toes desperately sought to grip. Balanced precariously on the thin metal plate, she stood one foot above the other on it. For oh, pity's sake, she wept, please stop, please, what are you doing to me? We're finishing something that should have been done a long time ago, said Steve. You're the only one who knows Sarah. No, no, it was a dream, he stopped. We can't use you, but with you dead, we can at last complete what we set out to do. Please, I won't say anything, I won't tell anybody. Oh yes, you will. And sooner or later, someone will listen. They were negotiating the narrowest and most dangerous part of the road at a speed that was far too fast. Goodbye, Sarah. No, please, Steve. But it was no good. He and Jason both let go of her wrist. She fell backwards, her feet still balancing on the tow bar. Desperately, she threw her arms out for something to hold. In the instant before she would have fallen to a painful death, her fingers caught and dug into the rubber ceiling strip around the tailgate. They were all laughing, joking with each other about how long she could hold on. Alex, faster! called Sandra. Then they all took up the chant. Faster, faster, faster! The vehicle was tearing along at a dangerous speed and swerving from side to side to shake her free. She was thrown about violently, but she refused to let go. Her fingernails had penetrated the soft seal, and now she held the separating rubber as two loops. 
They were coming towards the end of the winding section of the road and it was obvious that Sarah would not voluntarily give up her tenuous grip on life. Alex at the wheel had half turned, steering with one hand. Give her a push, Dave. Give her a push. We'll be out of the curve soon, he shouted as they hurled around the bend. Sarah looked in fear as Steve lifted his foot and bent his leg to kick at her. Suddenly, out of the fog appeared a truck. It was not moving, it was parked at the side of the road. The rear wheel jacked up, awaiting a repaired tyre. Alex snatched back at the steering wheel with both hands, but it was too late to avoid the front of the van hitting the back of the truck. The hood dove under the flatbed of the empty tray as the back of the tray sliced into their windscreen, penetrating deeply and cleanly severing Sandra's head from her body, throwing it into Barbara's lap. Barbara had no time to react as an instant later the engine, driven by the impact from the truck's rear axle, came through the firewall and into the front seat, crushing her and Sandra's bodies. Sarah had half fallen into the back of it, barely aware of the truck falling off the jack, deflecting the van, flicking it and sending it spinning sideways, the rear wheels sweeping out over the grass perch. The twisting motion caused Sandra to be hurled sideways rather than up against or into the back of the van. The crushing g-force of the rapid deceleration was more of a tearing away and she lost hold was tossed into the air. She was hurling sideways centimetres off the tailgate as the van slewed. The momentum through her was a glancing blow off the side pillar, ripping the still clutched ceiling strip with her. She was thrown from the van clear of the sharp gravel and into the roadside bushes. The thin branches ripped into her, snapping off, slowing her down as she crashed through and out the other side, landing in the long grass, weed and soft mud, beside a drainage channel, and rolling to a stop half in, half out to shallow water. She was bruised and cut over her whole body. Her left arm felt as if it was broken. She could barely lift her head towards the screaming noise of ripping metal. Several metres ahead, the van continued with its spin tore itself free from the truck and smashed out to a section of the edge. Sliding on the loop gravel, it had left the road and was airborne before landing on the steep slope facing back up the bank about five metres away. For a moment Sarah could see Alex, his head hung lifeless out of the window, crushed and covered in blood. The driverless van careered downhill in reverse until one of the rear wheels hit a tree stump. The front lifted high into the air, the van rolled over onto its side. Over and over it went downhill. On the second or third roll, the fuel tank erupted. And for the rest of the way to the bottom, it sprayed petrol, whipped out of the vehicle like a spinning wheel at a fireworks display. Finally, it came to rest, upright on its four wheels rocking violently from side to side. Sarah looked down at it dispassionately. She could see Steve Batter's face rise over the tailgate. She couldn't see his eyes over the distance, but she knew he was looking at her. Around him was that chilling green glow she had seen in the attic window. Steve was started to climb out. Then she saw Jason. They were still alive. They would never give up, not until she was as dead as they were. Sarah pulled her knees up under her. The pain was agonising, but using her an injured arm, she pushed herself up and stood hesitantly, then collapsed to the ground in agony. It felt like she was being stabbed in her lower leg. So this was it. She couldn't run. She would have to crawl. Sarah ached, every bone in her body seemed to be a fire. Desperately, she struggled to climb up the bank, but she had the strength. She couldn't run, she couldn't even crawl. What could she do to stop them? They would not leave her alive. They would come after her until the fires of hell consumed them. 
Sarah stopped, trying to drag herself, and turned to look over her shoulder. There was no escape. Jason and Steve were getting out now. Reluctantly, Sarah returned, climbed onto her hands and sinking knee. Dragging her possibly broken leg, she began to stumble painfully back towards them. Putting herself against the deepest feelings of self-preservation, he closed the gap between them and her, all falling forward than any attempt at walking as she descended the hill. She could clearly see the green glow about them now and the glowing eyes. Steve was less than 20 metres away from her when he stopped and picked up a large rock. He drew his hand back and started towards her again. Sarah was crying, tears pouring down her cheeks. She felt the pockets of her jacket, reassuring herself that the small, hard rectangle was still there. This time I really woke her up, she mumbled, as her fingers slipped into the material around the plastic. She stopped and dropped to her good knee, close to where the dew on the grass held a rainbow glimmer. Steve was barely metres away now, as she pulled her out, her hand out, to lean on the ground. He was close enough to see her movement and quickened his pace, readying his arm and the rock. He had meant so much to her. They all had. Even the times when they had argued had been good times. But this was not the Steve she remembered. That Steve had died many, many years ago. She picked her finger on the cigarette writer's tab. Nothing happened. For a moment, Steve slowed. He looked at her. It was as if he was somewhere deep down, in this shell, remembering. Through the clouds of death, the goodness that remained was giving her one final chance to release them both from evil. Then he came from her. Sarah flicked again. This time it worked. She looked at him. Sorry, she whispered, as she touched a flame to the petrol soap grass. There was a thunderous whoosh, and the ground ignited in front of her. She was thrown backwards by the blast, clear of the flames as the scorching heat drew the air from around her. A flaming column evaporated the very air in its ferocity, tearing down the hill towards the ruptured water, engulfing Steve and then Jason and finally what remained of the girls and Alex in the petrol-soaked vehicle. In moments it seemed like the whole hillside was afire. Sarah could feel the intense heat on her scorched face as the van exploded. The shock wave knocking her to the ground. She struggled onto her side, expecting her skull to be crushed at any moment. But Steve had not moved. He was standing still, his clothes burning from him. He uttered no noise, he just stood staring at her with hate-filled eyes, and suddenly looked skywards, letting out a terrifying scream that frightened her more than she could ever believe possible. He dropped to his knees, through the fire his gaze fell back at her, but the eyes had changed. For a fleeting moment there were Steve's eyes, gone was the hate, gone was the fear, only love and regret remained. For an instant they were together again, before he fell forward to the ground, bursting into flames as the fire totally consumed. She watched, feeling nothing, no compassion, no pity. These were not her friends. This was not how she would remember them. She felt empty. There was only one thing on her mind, spoken through her scorched lips. Burn, damn you, burn in hell. And that is the end of this story. I hope I have entertained you. And maybe I will be able to again in some other time. I bid you farewell.